organizers for this um, opportunity to speak in this seminar. Okay, so uh, let me begin with um, a conjecture of uh, Knezer in the arithmetic setting. Due to Knezer, he raised it in his ICM talk 1962. So K is a number field and the G is a semi-simple, sim simply connected linear algebraic group. We find over K. Okay, so if X is a principal homogeneous space under G, homogeneous space under G, which admits rational points or all completions over all completions of the number field, completions of K, then X itself has a K rational point. So in this case, whenever uh, the statement holds for uh, every principal homogeneous space, we say that simply say Hasse principle holds for G. Hasse principle holds for G. If for every principal homogeneous space, this local global principle for rational points happens. So we, uh, we may, uh, also rephrase it as in terms of GABA cohomology. Let me denote by SHA FG, SHA KG as a kernel of the set H1 KG to all the completions H1 KVG. H1 classifies isomorphism class of principal homogeneous spaces with trivial element corresponding to the principal homogeneous space with a rational point then uh, the Hasse principle says shark AG is trivial. Okay, this is uh, this is Knezer's conjecture, and uh, in fact, the the title of his uh, of his talk lecture is simply simply connected groups in arithmetic connected groups in arithmetic. This is the title of his talk. And in fact, uh, he was the first one to bring into context the, the simply connected groups when one looks at Hasse principle for in the, in the context of number fields for torsors and the linear algebraic groups. He was the first one to just pinpoint this is where one can expect um, Hasse principle well, I mean, uh, now this is uh, uh, con the conjecture, uh, the above is a theorem, Hasse principle, the above is a theorem now. And um, uh, Knezer himself, uh, for all classical groups, he, he wrote down a proof, classical groups, and also probably some exceptional groups, and harder for other exceptional groups. And then Chernuso, there's this was very quick after the conjecture was made already in the 60s, but the case of E8 waited a couple of decades and the proof is due to Chernesov. So this is the history of the conjecture in the case of um, number fields. Well, in this context, there were several questions raised in, uh, for more general fields with respect to Hasse principle. So let me state some conjectures and questions or classes of fields. So, so F is a semi-global field. So semi-global field is simply a function field of a curve, X or K, a curve, integral curve, and uh, K is complete discrete value field. 
you take function field in uh, sorry it's a complete discrete value field it's a function field in one variable or a complete discrete value field we just call them semi global in short so we have the following conjecture we'll call it conjecture c this was uh, proposed by Kuliuttelin, myself and Sunish in a paper. So if K is, if X is a, or rather I'll just say function field, let, let F, let F be the function field, the function field of a periodic curve. Field of a periodic curve. This is a semi global field, but with special classes of semi global field, periodic field. And uh, G is again, uh, I'll use this contraction semi simple, simply connected linear algebraic group defined over F. algebraic group over F, then Hasse principle holds for G. So this was the conjecture for function fields of periodic curves. And of course, uh, lurking behind are the more general questions. I call Q a similar statement, whether it is true or not, over general semi-global fields. Okay, so here, uh, what does one, uh, this is a question mark, whether such a thing can hold over a general semi-global field. And uh, so, the here, uh, when we talk of Hasse, uh, Hasse principle, or in the case of number fields, there is a canonical choice of places of K with respect to which you look at completions. But in this setting, Hasse principle is with respect to all discrete valuations of f. So you take various discrete valuations of f and complete f with respect to these discrete valuations. If the space has a local point, does it have a global point? So this is the, this more general question is lurking behind, whereas uh, we, we propose the conjecture in the case of function fields of periodic curves. So we proposed it after checking essentially for all quasi split simply connect quasi split groups we prove this conjecture is true and then we raise it for a more general setting so this is cp so this gave us some kind of incentive to propose a more general conjecture of course even uh, this question it may look i mean okay so but the the point is um, even one example of a group for which Hasse principle fails over such fields. It took a very long time to arrive at such examples. Okay, so so today's talk uh, is mainly to focus on first one example to show that the question Q in general has a negative answer. You cannot expect this or a general semi-global field. So the Knazer's arithmetic term is quite important, though it is a high dimensional arithmetic. And I just want to uh, indicate some positive results concerning conjecture C. Basically, the conjecture C is resolved for all classical groups. I'll come to it. But first, let me begin with the example. Example of a semi-global field where the question, uh, the question of Hasse principle fails for even simply connected groups. Okay, so, so the example first. Okay, so this example uh, is uh, to appear uh, in a paper of um, Kolyuttalin. And Harbeter Hartman Krashen. Hartman Krashen. And 
as I can Suresh, it was some kind of a project, uh, joint project cons considering uh, constant group schemes over um, two dimensional schemes. Okay, so this is where the example originated. It's a joint work with these people. So what is the setting? Suppose you take a field K, K is a field. Suppose that characteristic of K is zero and the complete discrete valuation ring T is K double parenthesis T and uh, the complete discrete valued field is the function field, this Laurent series field. And uh, so the G which I'm going to uh, take is just all the way G is over K. So you, you can even take any reductive group, connected reductive group. So an isotropic, this condition I'll put for. Okay, you take uh, any connected reductive an isotropic group over K. Okay, this is the group I start with, which I'll extend to the semi-global field. And uh, what is the curve? What is the function field? X over K is a, a smooth projective geometrically integrated curve. Projective geometrically integrated curve. And uh, F is the function field of uh, X. So I'm going to treat G as a group over F. So what are the conditions needed for the failure of Hasse principle? Conditions. So first is some kind of an arithmetic condition on G. So you have this R equivalence classes R contained in G of K, so-called R trivial elements. This is a normal subgroup of GK. That is simply the set of all elements which are equivalent to the identity, R equivalent to the identity. That means uh, there is a, a rational morphism from the affine line to G, which sends uh, zero to identity. They can be connected by um, a uh, rational line. So, the set of all elements um, R equivalent to G is simply the subgroup R. And uh, we need the condition that GK mod R is not trivial. That every element is, every element is not, there is an, uh, this GK mod R is not identity. That means you can find an element of GK, which is not R trivial. This is the basic condition on G. There exists a row in GK minus r okay so this is the condition we need on the underlying group and then we have a geometric condition condition namely you have this smooth projective curve over k so suppose x to t is a regular proper model This a regular proper model with uh, X not the reduced special fiber. First T is a complete DVR. You take the reduced special fiber. So the geometric condition is that X not contains a rational triangle with rational vertices. With rational vertices. So this is the condition on the this is the condition on the curve that there is a triangle which is with, with sides rational lines and with vertices uh, rational points okay so this is the condition on the curve then then you can show that sha with the the the, the failure of fast principle which is denoted sha omega f of f comma g is not true so you have a non-trivial element, Hasse principle fails for G. Hasse principle fails for G. Okay, this is the, this is the example. So before uh, going to uh, a, a sketch a proof of this, uh, how, how this fails Hasse principle, I just want to say that such examples certainly exist. So you can just take, you want G simply, semi-simple, simply connected. 
So you have this Platonov example, so of uh, uh, SL1D, which is semi simple, simply connected, where D is you can just take QP, the field QP, X, Y. This will be your base field K. At least uh, two Lorentz two variables, uh, power series variables over the periodic field. Then he proves that, um, in fact, um, SK1D is trivial. SL, SL1D modulo its commutator, which is the same as R equivalence classes by Voskresensky. So SL1, SL1D. K points modulo R equivalence. This is not trivial. Okay, so this is the example of Platonov, the first uh, example to show that um, the the Tanaka Artin problem of Nasir Tits conjecture has a negative answer. So you have groups over such fields where it, this SL1D mod R is not trivial. This is one example of a simply connected group over the over a field K. Of course, it's anisotropic. These D is a, uh, in fact, D is a biquaternion algebra, division algebra, biquaternion division algebra, which can be written down. So, so there are Gs uh, which are available. Of course, um, certainly you can get, uh, can, uh, uh, can there is rather there exist curves. Certainly, there exist curves, curves X over K such that the reduced special fiber of a model has a rational triangle. It's very easy to write down examples, has a rational triangle. Okay, so examples exist. Now let me just uh, go on to, um, go on to a sketch of the proof of how, how it works, why the Shah is not trivial. Okay, here we use the patching techniques of of Harbeta, I'll contract this Harbeta Hartman Krashen. So maybe we'll have a revision of uh, some of the things which happened in uh, uh, Krashen's lecture, some notations and background. So let me just, uh, so let me see whether I can, I had just written down the, I don't want to write down the whole details, but let me go over the setting. So this is the patching setting. So K is a complete discrete value field. T is the discrete valuation ring. T is a parameter. Little K is the residue field. So, so X over capital K is a smooth geometrically integral curve and F is the function field. This is a semi-global field. Now, uh, this X to T is a regular proper model of the curve X over K and X naught is the reduced special fiber. And we can assume that X naught is a union of regular curves with normal crossings, possibly after blowing up X. Okay, what is the patch on X? This is, it is a pair U comma P, where P in X naught in the special fiber is a finite set of closed points containing all the nodal points of X naught. Just, just a finite bunch of closed points of X naught, just to include all the nodal points. So this is the this is a special fiber, you would like to include in your P all the nodal points of the special fiber. And what is U? U is the collection of irreducible components of the special fiber with complemented by the, the set of points P. They are in bijection, of course, with the irreducible components of the special fiber. Okay, and the B stands for the branches. <coughs> branches are precisely pairs U comma P, where U is a component in U, and P is a point of P with the property that P is in U closure. Suppose you take this component and you just take this point P, which would have been omitted from U. So that would be a pair in a branch. So these are the three classes of sets. P is finite set of closed points. U, the finite set of irreducible components of the special fiber complemented P. And B is the set of branches. Okay, corresponding to each one of the objects in P, U or B, there is a field associated to it. So for U, which is a component, so what is the field FU? The FU is simply the fraction fields of R U hat 
R u R u is simply the rational functions functions on X which are regular on this open set u in the special file. Okay, and you are completing along the along t this this two dimensional regular in R u this is the completion along t, and you take t is the parameter in the discrete register in t, and you are taking the field of fractions. Okay, this is F u, and F p. For every closed point P in this finite set, F P is first you take the local ring of P on the scheme X, which is a two-dimensional regular local ring. You complete it along the maximal ideal M P, and you take the field of fractions. In the case of equal characteristic, this looks like um, formal power series ring in two variables. And finally, the branch P P equal to U comma P, the branch field. is simply the completion of the two dimensional fp at the discrete valuation associated to the generic point of u you have this u and a point p here this is u and a p this this the at this point this u passes is produces a parameter at the local ring you complete uh, you complete fp along this discrete valuation so f the branch field is a discrete discrete valued field discrete complete discrete valued field so you have these fields defined okay so given this they define a uh, sha up the 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 sha with respect to this patch of f comma g where g is any connected linear algebraic group over f they define this object to be the kernel of h1 fg to the product of h1 fx g as x varies in u and p these classify principal homogeneous spaces under f under g over f which have rational points over f u s and f p s these local fields f u s and f p s for all u in u and p in p okay all the patching fields so this is sha u p and they prove the following theorem that this sha set which they define with respect to a patching field is trivial in other words there is local global principal provided g is if g is a f rational group that is function field of g or f is a purely transcendental extension then they prove that this sha is trivial and they use this to prove several standard hasse principal results and uh, so we are going to use this uh, this technique in our example but uh, the point is what is the connection of this sha with uh, the sha we think of with respect to the discrete valuations we want to look at sha with respect to all the discrete valuations of the field the fact is that if you take a patch with respect to a model this sha up is a subset of sha omega f fg okay this always is contained in the uh, the sha set with respect to all discrete valuation all discrete valuations of f so in a situation when you want to show this sha set is not trivial with respect to discrete valuations it is enough to produce a model and a patch such that this sha set sha up fg is not trivial it's enough to show this non triviality of the sha in the patching setting in order to get a counter example an example of failure of sha in the case of discrete valuations okay so let me go on to uh the example we have okay so you, so if just for simplicity let me assume that x not is simply a one triangle there is one rational triangle that's that's the special there it makes no difference but let me assume so let me call it um, so you have a rational triangle so this is uh, these are rational lines l1 l2 l3 the sides and uh, let me call this the vertices p12 these are three rational points p23 p12 so in this case this is the special fiber and the set of points p obviously i'm going to take just the nodal points p13 p23 p12 the set of uh, these these are the three uh, points in the set p and u are the 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 complements of the nodal points on these lis u1 u2 u3 there are three uh, three three of these us and three points and what are the branches there are six branches which we can write down so corresponding to the pair f okay u1 this contains uh, p12 the vertex p12 
is in the closure of u1 and you have f u1 p13 and dot 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 you have this uh, this bunch of uh, six branches so what is uh, so we want an example where uh, sha is not trivial is not trivial so what does it mean by the description of hhk so you have this product g of the branches p in branches and you have this double coset decomposition product g of f pi this is the points pi and here you have the components ui g of f ui where ui's are in the pi's are in p and ui's are in u and p are in the branches okay you have this, you have to show this double coset is not trivial because this double coset classifies the elements in sha you want to show this is not trivial so you have to basically produce an element we say you have to produce an element which doesn't admit a factorization to produce to exhibit an alpha uh, in product of g of fp as p varies or branches which is not fact this is the term they use which is not factorizable which simply means it can be it is not just each branch it is not a question of breaking up the element into the corresponding u1 and p1 there is the simultaneous factorization okay this does, which does not admit simultaneous factorization this is what we want to produce okay so the idea is there is a, see, these are all different fields hanging around with some inclusions for pairs of them into the branch but we want to compare the uh, all these elements in the factorization in one common group okay so to compare uh, all uh, all the elements i mean all the elements of g of the branch and g of the us and g of fps in a common domain in a common group so this is possible so there is a, when you look at fp this is a complete discrete valued field because it is a completion of the the fp two dimensional completion this looks like for any of the any of the branches it looks like the residue field with iterated Laurent series field. Every branch looks like this. And G is a group which is defined over K. If it is anisotropic, then you, you know by rigidity that this K points KXT, this is the same as G of KX power series T. The points are the same because G is anisotropic and you can specialize it to you can go mod uh, mod x mod t you can come here and this again coincides with the power series kx and from here you can come down to gk so you have this specialization so in fact this specialization can be defined in a very general setting not necessarily anisotropic any connected reductive group so this specialization map g of fp from the, the iterated power series to g of k if you go modulo R equivalence classes, this is an isomorphism. This is an isomorphism of groups when you go mod R equivalence. Okay, this is a, um, it's in a paper of Gilles where he constructs the specializations in very general setting. Okay, so we can look at elements of the branch fields and take them, take their R equivalence classes in GK mod R. How about these fields FUs and FPs? So let us look at FU. So you have, suppose you have this U1, there are two points, this is U1, U1, and there are two vertices P2, P3 here. So you have this G of FU1. Of course, FU1, there are, uh, uh, is contained in two branch fields. You can go to G of F, there are two branches, U1, P2, and you can also go to G of F, u1 p3 there are two points uh, vertices on this so you have two branches so you can take gf inside the two branches and then you can use the specialization to gk and you can go mod r okay 
all right but if you do go in two different directions if they don't match then you cannot compare the elements in the in the last group gk mod r however because u1 is part of a rational line it is easy to check verify that this diagram commutes you can go whichever way you like you get the same uh, the same uh, element in gk mod r if you start with elements in geo this is true for each one of these uis so you can compare the elements in fuis in gk mod r by embedding them into the branches and taking the double specialization how about uh, the suppose p1 you take so you have the p1 and there are two branches u1 u2 u2 u3 the sides of the triangle so you can get fp1 inside one of these branches g of f u2 p1 or to g of f u3 p1 there are two branches here and then you can come down to gk mod r through the specialization these are isomorphisms but it is um, not so obvious this diagram commutes this can be true but it needs some work so this diagram commutes okay so we have a way to compare all the elements uh, of all the fields concerned as elements of gk mod r now let us verify what happens to this uh, what is the element we take in the branch g of fp whose class we are going to prove is uh, non trivial you just take the element x to be you can you take the row which is in gk mod r in gk which is not r trivial this is contained in just take some one particular branch g of say f u1 p2 any one vertex you choose one branch and take it this row in this one branch and then one in all the other there are six, five other components you take the trivial element in all the other components this is my element x and i want to prove that this is not factorizable okay okay this you can sense uh, why it is not factorizable because you go around this and try to compare then there is a loop there is a problem so i have written down uh, exactly what happens okay you have this element row 111 in this product of branch field g of branch field if it is factorizable you have this table like this that row is alpha u1 beta p2 and all the other uh, other factorizing uh, components you will have identity on the left equal to alpha ui beta pj so this is the situation if it admits a factorization but we can read these equations in gk mod r so there if you compare this uh, these five equations you get all the beta pi's are equal and they are all equal to alpha u1 inverse okay you get it from these equations so you plug it in back here in gk mod mod r row becomes 1 in gk gk mod r but we are choosing an element which is not r trivial and this leads to a contradiction this is just a simple combinatorics once you have this element row treated as an element in the g of branch you get a tuple which is not factorizable simultaneously factorizable as a corollary you get that sha up is not trivial by or beta hartman crashen and in particular so this is also not trivial the discrete value because this is a subset of this and this is not trivial therefore the sha with respect to fg is not trivial okay this is the proof and the key ingredient is the existence of non r trivial elements in g of some base field k okay this is the example and uh, so we now we go on to the second part of the talk so the conjecture c this is the arithmetic part so here the i'll just straight away state a theorem and there are many uh, many people to whom it has been attributed g is uh, uh, so is a semi simple simply connected linear algebraic group linear algebraic group defined over f 
f is now a function field of a periodic curve. We'll use the term a uh, good characteristic case. That means the prime P is good for G. I'll explain what are the primes in mode. Characteristic case. Uh, so suppose G is of classical type. G is of, I'll just list them soon, of classical type. You can assume it is almost simple, it doesn't matter. Then Hasse principle holds for G. That is conjecture is settled for all classical groups um, over F, provided the characteristic is good for good characteristic. Let me just say what, what are the classical groups first. G is of the type SL1A, where A is a central simple algebra, or the special unitary group of a central simple algebra with an emulation of second kind over F. And you have this uh, symplectic group of an algebra with a symplectic involution and a spinner group of an algebra with an orthogonal involution. These are the type of groups which we come across in the list. And good characteristic, so P does not divide index A in uh, F or SL1A, and P does not divide twice index A in the case of SU A sigma. And two, P is not equal to two in the other two cases for the symplectic and the spinner groups. This P is not two is the only assumption. So in all these cases, good characteristic and one of the classical type, then has a principle holds. So maybe uh, the known um, first for um, for B and C and BN, that is symplectic orthogonal um, uh, case uh, involutions. Also, in the case of SU of A sigma, where index of A is at most two, or maybe two times um, square three, or uh, slightly more general. Okay, the, here this is due to who and Preeti independently. Preeti independently, they prove this uh, result for these cases. Okay, and uh, so the critical cases, major cases left out were SL1A and SU of A sigma. These were the open cases after the after the results of who and Preeti. So SL1A, what is here H1 F SL1A? This is simply F star, the Puma sequence. This gives F star mod radius norm A star. Okay, a Hasse principle statement says that an element of F star is locally a radius norm, locally with respect to discrete valuations of F implies it's a radius norm. So this is very, it strikes a familiar note uh, compared to the um, number field setting where uh, we, we have this result of um, Hasse mass shilling that an element in the number field is a reduced norm from our algebra, if and only if it is uh, positive at all places where the algebra, all the real places where the algebra ramifies, because uh, this is a local global principle because at all finite places, the reduced norm is subjective over the periodic case. Okay, so this is a, this is a high dimensional analog of this statement, this conjecture. So there is one case which it was known, suppose index of A is square free. So here we have the Suslin invariant H1F SL1A to, to H3 of F mu n tensor 2. So you have the classes here given by elements in F star mode radius norms. You send it to the cup product of lambda and A, where lambda is treated as an element in F star mode F star power n, which is in H1. And the class of A defines an element in H2 of F mu n. Okay, so this is the Suslin invariant. And uh, uh, Mercurial Suslin, this is a non trivial result. We prove that S has trivial kernel if, if uh, index A is square free. This invariant is defined always. If the index is square free, 
then they prove that this invariant has trivial kernel. So this is one non-trivial result. So we convert the problem of local global principle to cohomology. And here we can appeal to a result of Cato, which says that on the right hand side, there is indeed mu and tensor two to the local H3 product, product of H3 of F V mu and tensor two is injective. So there is no kernel locally for the degree three Galois cohomology and there is no kernel for the Cicilline invariant. This implies um, uh, the conjecture for SL1A with square free index. Square free index. Okay, so but uh, the, the general case remained open and this was settled by Preeti, myself and Suresh that uh, uh, conjecture holds true for SL1A general index, but a good characteristic case. That means the good characteristic is simply uh, P does not divide. We are taking a periodic P, P does not divide index A. So the good characteristic, it was uh, include a local global principle for um, uh, tosses under SL1A. So this uh, finishes the case of A and 1. And the only case since then was the final straw of this uh, classical groups list and that was proved this is the latest that was proved by Suresh and myself if G is um, SU of A sigma the unit special unitary group A is the central simple algebra over L sigma is uh, L over F evolution L over F is a quadratic extension on A that means uh, L restricted to sigma is not trivial and the invariant field is there. Then Hasse principle holds for G. Once again, uh, P does not divide two times index. Okay, so this finishes uh, the case of all classical groups. And in the rest of the lecture, I would try to outline a proof of this theorem. So we use once again, patching techniques, patching methods. So first of all, the Hasse principle is with respect to all discrete valuations. So there are always in this kind of a situation, there are two steps if you want to use, reduce the question to patching methods. First, step one. Suppose you take an element psi in SHA1 FG. Take an element, G is SU A sigma. So we, we prove that, prove that there exists a model X to T and um, a patch UP on X such that the psi belongs to SHA UP. It comes from a Shaw for a patch. This is the first reduction. This is not some generality because um, so far, each time we want to reduce something to a patching situation, we prove this result, okay? And it is, it involves work and it is no generality that you can reduce it to the patching situation. At least we don't have a generality so far for reducing the discrete valuation short uh, to a problem on patching Shaw. Okay, this has to be proved and once, and the, what is the second step? Of course, once you have reduced to the patching SHA, you want to prove that SHA UP for any such patch, FG is true. Okay, these are the two steps. Okay, let me explain step two. Okay, let uh, just, I just want to give a hint of what goes into the proof. So first, G is SU of A sigma, you have this, up to some point there are generalities. You have the special unitary group and the unitary group. And then you can take reduced norm and that goes into the center. But the center whose norm to the base F is one, see R L over F of R1 L over F of GM. 
So it goes into normal elements in the center. We have this exact sequence of algebraic groups. So when you write down the long exact sequence, at least slightly long exact sequence in Gaga cohomology, so what you get is suppose L star one, this is R L over F, R one L over F of GM, the F points of this, that is set of all normal elements in L star. Then you have the sequence L star one modulo reduced norm of the unitary group of F, K, F points of this to H1 F S U of A sigma to H1 F the unit U of A sigma. Okay, so we are in the case of proving the patching choice one. So the, the lucky point here is that U of A sigma is a rational group, is an F rational group. The unitary group is rational and therefore by HHK, you have that the Shaw of F U sigma is trivial. This is the patching Shaw. So we use this result. So when you look at the corresponding uh, corresponding uh, uh, sequence, when you restrict to Shaw, because the Shaw of this is trivial, so you have this following Shaw of L star one modulo reduced norm of the unitary group of A sigma. So this uh, is this is in bijection with Shaw of uh, F Shaw U P of F S U of S. This is what we are interested in. So this whole thing reduces to some question of sub quotients of the uh, the field L star normal elements mod. But here the real uh, good point is that we have the following beautiful des description by Mercury of what is the reduced norm from the unitary group. So can you describe the reduced norms? Yes, indeed. And he says these are precisely, these are normal, this is a subgroup of L star one. These are all the elements lam uh, lambda in L star one with the property that lambda can be written as mu inverse sigma mu, where mu is an L star because it's normal. You can always write it as mu inverse sigma mu. It's a quadratic extension. Mu is L star, but it is also in reduced norm. Okay. So if it has to be, it will be in the image of the unitary, um, reduced norms of unitary group, if it can be written as mu inverse sigma mu, where mu is a reduced norm from A star. This is a description of the reduced norms of unitary, uh, unitary group. This is very nice. And the important fact to note is that it is independent of sigma. Whichever involution you choose, it doesn't, because right hand side is purely in terms of reduced norms. Whatever involutions you choose, this, this reduced norm group is just the same. Namely, mu inverse sigma mu, where mu is a reduced norm. So we have an explicit description of this and we want to prove this shy is trivial. So this is what we want to prove. So what is the statement? So what is the shaw of the left hand side? Shaw of L star one modulo. So this, uh, this reduced norm U, U A sigma. Now we can describe this set as precisely the following. This set of lambda in L star one. Lambda can be written as locally mu x inverse sigma mu x, where mu x belongs to reduced norms of ax. This ax is simply a tensor fx, where fx are all the branch fields fu's and fp's, okay? x in u union p. You go to these fu's and fp's and look at the reduced norms. Lambda is factorizable as mu x inverse sigma mu x locally at all the places. And you have to mod it out by simply mu inverse sigma mu, where mu belongs to reduced norm of a. Okay, this is Sha on the left hand side is precisely this set, which you want to prove is trivial. Okay, every element locally expressible as mu inverse sigma mu, where mu is a reduced norm for all the branch fields, you can express it as mu inverse sigma mu, where mu is a reduced norm. This, the question reduces to this. So there is no involution floating around except that the algebra supports an involution. This is a purely reduced norm study question. And uh, to understand this, we need to know what, see general algebra is very hard to decide what are reduced norms. So we just need structure of, of the algebras 
AX, okay, where X is either a branch field or X is in a point or also a fuse, okay. What, what, is, what is the condition on AX? A supports an involution of second kind, which is simply A, L over F of co-restriction of this is zero. It supports an involution if and only if co-restriction is zero. This is the only cohomological condition on A. Then you would like to describe some of the radius norms from A or the structure of A. So I'll give the list. So first you, you take a branch FP. This is a complete discrete valued field with residue field with residue field F residue field. Also a complete discrete valued field. You know this looks like KXT typically, not in general, but so, so it's like a complete discrete value field with residue field is also a complete discrete value field. Discrete value field. Okay, this is what the branches look like. So here we have there is a, this is LP is the quadratic extension. There are various possibilities. If LP is to FP is degree two, let us assume this is degree two. In generally, it could also split if it is degree two. So the first case is if LP or FP, this is an extension of complete DVRs, so discrete valued fields is unramified and, and the residue, residual extension LP or FP, K, KP, this is also unramified. Let us assume both the given extension as well as the residual extension are unramified. Here you have a good description of AP. This is simply a cyclic algebra pi delta with respect to zeta, where pi delta, these are parameters which span the maximal ideal at P. What is P? P is the branch corresponding to U and P. There's a point floating around. These are generators with the maximal ideal of the point, which treated as elements of AP. And uh, so this is the cyclic algebra. Zeta is actually in LP star, root of unity, which is not in FP star. So this reduce this is always a cyclic algebra in this case. And uh, if LP or degree, degree two, it is uh, ramified, the complementary case, or it could be unramified, but the residual extension is, is residual extension is ramified. In this case, then this AP becomes simply a quaternion algebra. Both the cases of cyclic and quaternion algebras one can easily describe the reduced norms. In knowing the uh, knowing it is pi delta or just a quaternion algebra, we can read off the norms. Of course, one case where it becomes a product of FP cross FP, we cannot say anything about the algebra. We don't need it. And also, maybe I, there is a similar description. Description over the the two-dimensional complete fields. You can also describe. It's always uh, either a quaternion algebra or a cyclic algebra corresponding to pi delta, even in the case of complete fields. And having this description, one is able to understand the norm structure and prove the result. And once again, one line about what goes into the description of these algebras. So let me say one line. So A is an algebra over the complete, suppose the FP is a complete discrete value field the branch, the class of the algebra, you can write it as class of an unramified algebra plus a cyclic algebra, E pi, uh, where E over L is the cyclic and pi is a parameter for the discrete variation, parameter for the, and in the case of a complete DVR, you can always break the algebra into broader class of an unramified algebra, A not unramified, and uh, and this is a cyclic algebra corresponding. What is E over L? E over L is a lift of residues. Lift, lift of residue of A with respect to the valuation V pi. We have the residue for the algebra, the, the delta V pi of the cyclic algebra, which is in H1. Uh, this uh, Sorry, I mean, just let me just, so E over, so we have this residue of this algebra, 
delta v pi of a which defines something in h1 of the residue field kappa p with values in z mod and z this is a cyclic cyclic uh, extension call this e naught and e is a lift of e naught lift of a residue that is a cyclic extension and the co restriction of a l over f is trivial in, in fact gives the fact that so you have this h1 of sorry this is in this not in kp but in lp the residue of the big field lp so this gives that this uh, this co restriction from h1 lp to z mod nz to h1 kp z mod nz this class of e naught which is the residue it goes to zero under this again the co restriction map the norm map from lp to kappa p which now the real point is that whenever you have a cyclic a cyclic extension whose co restriction in this quadratic extension is zero these are precisely dihedral extensions of the residue field dihedral okay you have a you have a cyclic extension of lp and this is a quadratic extension of kp and the co restriction of this class in h1 is zero is precisely saying that this extension is a dihedral extension so we need to analyze the kind of dihedral extensions you have over this branch fields and the residue fields and we were very excited about this cohomological description of dihedral extensions but it looks that this is already in a paper of hale knus rost and tignon they exactly has this description of dihedral extensions the cohomological description okay once you have this uh, we need an analysis of the dihedral extensions and or maybe a local field or a global whatever positive kind of local field whatever and then you put in back to get information about the algebra a you started with modulo this unranked part which can be understood and this leads to the description of the algebra along these branch fields as precisely cyclic algebra or a quaternion algebra uh, in the case when the local extension lp or K, K, fp is not split okay so basically that's all i want to say thank you very much thank you thank you is there any question any question any comment if you would like if you wish to ask question just switch on your mic and uh, proceed any question okay i have um, a hello yeah yeah uh, i have a knife question so the in the this whole thing the ultimate residue field is a finite field right yes. so steady yes. field if you replace finite field by a function uh, say a formal power series field in one variable over the complex field does the proof break down no we do use a lot of uh, class field theory i mean there is uh, a strong approximation all kinds of things or or uh, about global fields in the process i do not know which one of them could go through in other setting which ones don't so mm -hmm. i'm not sure uh, the method is completely using the class field theory of local and global fields mm -hmm. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, one can go through the steps and see where there could be a hit. You know? Yeah. Um, I also have a naive question. Um, why doesn't the contour example work over a piadic curve? Uh, which uh, which count? Uh, oh, okay. It's counter example or a piadic fur? this is a, exactly the all the ultimate residue fields are all finite fields you can't get r trivial elements um, in gk mod r basically all groups there are no non trivial uh, elements uh, in g g of uh, finite field which is not r trivial and in fact even if you take a piadic field <laughs> and a simply connected group gk mod r is trivial it's always r trivial okay so the yeah thank you no more questions more questions
If not, then let's thank the speaker again. And so thank you very much for a wonderful talk.